thanks for tuning in to the Just Go Play podcast, where we look to develop and promote a positive youth sports experience. As always, we are available for speaking and private engagements and can be reached at info at justgoplay.ca. You can also catch full video versions of our podcast on our YouTube channel. And don't forget to visit us at justgoplay.ca. Enjoy the episode. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Just Go Play podcast. I'm here with my awesome hosts, Matt Young and Elisa. Uh, guys, we got an awesome show today. We have two very important questions, and I think we can talk for two days about these two questions, but I'm excited. I'm, I, you know, I'm full of energy and, and ready to go, and I hope you guys are ready because I'm going to be drilling you guys today. Yeah, let's get into it, Daryl. I want to ask you the question. You're the phys ed teacher, yet taught physical education in the faculty of U- University of Toronto. Uh, kids came to you after they went through their whole class with professors because you took the information that, that they were presenting and made it relevant and relative to what the kids wanted. So you've got a lot of experience. Number one question we're seeing trending on the internet today, is phys ed dead? Go. Awesome question. Is phys ed dead? Yes, it's dead. It, in the form it's in right now, because we don't we don't have qualified people delivering quality services to these people. In a nutshell, you can't have a, a basketball player who's never played hockey teaching kids how to play hockey. That's what's happening. We got the wrong people showing these kids the way for physical education. Now, and I shouldn't say, I, I don't want to pay a brush over all these teachers because that that sounds horrible. Now, I'm an ex-teacher and I have a lot of great friends that are teachers. They they do an awesome job, and I'm not I'm not saying some are good, some are bad. It is what it is. We've since we've gone away from uh, specialists, phys ed teachers at all the schools. The phys ed programs have declined. I like I'm going to use this quick example of myself when I used to, and I'm not, I don't like to talk myself up, but I'm going to tell you it this time. I have to tell you the story real quick. Tell us a story. When I was phys ed, a phys ed teacher, and this is grade six students, I would make sure there was a fitness component and there was testing. And there was testing. It's okay to test a kid in school and tell him he's dumb, but it's not okay to test a kid and tell him they're out of shape. That didn't make sense to me. So we had our baseline testing, you know, with five push-ups, a plank, all that stuff at the beginning of the year. And it wasn't to shame them. It was just to see where they were. And then after we did that, we showed them how they could get better. We did a little bit each week, showing them how they can get better. And by the end of the year, all of them, they're, they're all, everybody improved together. It wasn't the top guys stayed the top guys everybody showed improvement. And that's what my goal as a phys ed teacher was to make people competent at the end of the year. If we did volleyball, and I remember this specifically volleyball, I sucked at volleyball. I sucked. I spent time practicing at home. I don't, I don't know if teachers do that anymore. I practiced passing the ball. I practiced volleying because I wanted to make sure I could demonstrate well. And you know what I did? My whole goal was that these guys were what I call street ready. And that's going to sound street ready. When I say street ready, I meant if their buddies called them up and said, hey, bud, hey, let's go play some volleyball outside or let's go down to the beach and play some volleyball. They were competent enough that they could pass, volley the ball, and know the rules and get by. I didn't want them to be stars. I just wanted to be proficient enough that they could be involved in the game. I didn't, I wasn't, my goal for these students was not to make them stars, but to make them familiar with the the fundamental movements of, or sports skills or whatever it was at the time. So they were comfortable going into a place and, and playing volleyball with their friends for recreational purposes. Beauty. I don't think that happens anymore, Matt. Yeah. You know what? And and first of all, I'm really glad, you know, we put you on the spot. I ask you a yes or no question. And you did a good job in terms of we're not saying, you know, every single, there's tons of great phys ed teachers out there, but the problem is, and we all know that three of us know it, it's not, it's no longer the norm. It's the exception. So to have a good 
uh, specialist, qualified physical education specialist in your school is not no longer the norm. And, and you're right, Daryl, if you water it down and you're just having throwing Sally or Jim in there because they're on the rotation, one year they teach math, the next year they teach phys ed and they have no understanding, what you get is the California kickball and, and you turn people off uh, uh, the, the whole premise of, of quality movement. Um, so I, so I agree with that. At least what do you, what do you have to say for that? Well, I've been sitting here as quiet as it can be because I have a lot to say on this topic and I'm trying to pick and choose I have to stop. My points. Um, this, this whole, this whole conversation is so much bigger than just, you know, the PE space because we look at the school environment as a whole, and I'm going to talk primarily about the elementary school environment. That's where I do most of the work that I do. I'm not a teacher. I work with a number of teachers from generalists to PE specialists to administrators. I've done a lot of work with them and I've heard so many stories about how much they either hate delivering PE or anything to do with movement. I viscerally hate it. And they usually have a personal story from when they were in school about why it was awful and why they hate it. And now they, they're terrified every time they have to step into the gym with these kids especially the kids who are either, you know, the single sport athletes who are in the academies who are better than everybody and the kids who hate it and they're trying to motivate them to do something that they also hate. So I've worked with those teachers. I've also worked with the teachers, generalists and PE specialists who love it, who embrace it, who are saying, I, I love movement for myself and I'm going to show kids and whoever I'm working with how great it can be. So I've worked with the whole spectrum. Now this side is the minority. This side is the majority. That's our biggest problem. And, and the umbrella over it all is our value system. Our value system in schools has cut PE all the way down. We've cut the arts, we've cut any kind of specialty, and we've said, come in here and we're gonna teach a whole bunch of things other than, you know, the three of us are looking at PE as a pure entity when it comes to the art of, of movement. And so what do we have to teach? We have to teach sports skills, we have to teach fitness, we have to teach that motivation and joy and desire to want to be active. But now we've added in a whole bunch of other stuff. We're teaching sex ed, we're teaching health ed, we're teaching nutrition. We're adding things in and we're cutting it out when there's a music rehearsal because it needs to have the gym space. So now we don't really have the gym space. So PE has been you know, thrown out over there because we don't value it as a whole, as a society and as a ministry. And that's not gonna change in the near future, I don't think, until drastic things happen. So when we talk about is PE dead? Yeah, absolutely, because we don't value it anymore. I'm not gonna hear to shame the teachers about it. There are good teachers and not great teachers in every subject area, every single one. PE is something really unique because you physically have to put yourself on the stage and that's daunting to a lot of people. But how is it any different than telling a French teacher who's not a French teacher to teach French? So if I have to go in and I'm saying, okay, you're teaching French this year. And I'm going, I've never spoken a lick of French in my life. And now you're asking me to teach it. That happens. So it's not just happening in PE. But what I want to talk about today is what is, what is PE supposed to look like? So we talk about is PE dead? Well, what is PE? What is physical education today? Because when I was a kid, when you guys were kids, when my parents were kids, it's, it's evolved. And it's evolved today to a place that I'm not super confident in it in a lot of ways. Again, I know some people doing great work and I know some people who are just phoning it in because we don't value it anymore. So, so I'll ask you guys, what does PE look like? What is PE supposed to be as a, an academic subject? Because that's what it is. Okay, well, so that's a great question. Before I get to it, I have to pull my two cents in. Yeah. <laughs> What is great, 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 great. I'll come back to that. So I think the reasons, and, and Elisa, you're right, and you made some points that I just want to, I just want to highlight. You know, how's the landscape changed? The education landscape. You ask a great question, and and we're seeing more and more the business of education. So basically, it is if you don't get A's in these academic subjects and you don't go to college or university, you're not going to have a good job and you're not going to have a good life. Really, that's the message that's being marketed, and a trillion dollar student loan deficit in, in, in the largest country in the world tells us that people have bought into that. It's a trillion dollar student debt loan. So, so the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic have been prioritized over everything else uh, for right, wrong, or indifferent, but they have done what PE hasn't been able to do, which is show decision makers the money. And, and I think that's where PE needs to evolve. 
I've, I've talked to you guys about it at nausea. It, you know, that example with reading, writing, and arithmetic, um, the example of academies and clubs in the communities, basically what they've done is they've said, okay, uh, and Elisa, you talked about this last time and a couple podcasts ago, actually, where teachers and, you know, Daryl, people were mailing it in and expecting the least. So the consumer says, okay, well, hang on a second. If you're not going to provide that and uh, the entrepreneurs, Daryl and entrepreneurs say, well, we'll provide that. Um, problem is, is that it's physical education for the privileged. So it's not physical education for all, it's physical education for the privileged. So are you getting the best players, young men and women at those club settings? No, not necessarily. You're getting the, the, the young men and women whose parents can afford to send them there, who can transport them there, who can get them there. So um, again, on the theme of show me the money, physical education hasn't been able to establish itself for showing value. And Elisa, you talk about this all the time, and it is the value system. So we don't value our health enough to, to say, listen, physical education is really the foundation for all sport, health, activity, movement for the rest of your life. And it needs to happen. It can't be, um, you know, the, the ignored stepchild. It can't be the, the, this is the first thing that goes uh, because we've got another priority assembly, a class of this or that, it, you know, we, we're too quick to cut it. And I love the point that you made, Elisa, which is, and Daryl, which is, we don't have the physical, the specialist physical education teachers in schools anymore. If you don't have the specialist in there, it's definitely not going to improve. Um, you know, and then you get the specialist who, who sound off and go, well, I'm doing it. And this is the way it's always been. So how dare anyone come in new? And I know we're going to touch on our favorite uh, Joe Wicks coming up here. Um, well, hold on one sec. I want to ask you something just so our audience is understanding. Value. Are we talking money? Or like it's not important. Well, I, I mean, think we're talking both. Like well, you, yeah, you yeah, yeah, like right. people well, don't sure. value it. Like like that. I, some people can take it as it's not worth dough, or they can take it as we just don't care about it anymore. Yeah, because I think it's you both, pick, because you can pick it up on the street. I'm not gonna teach this guy any phys ed. He can just go on the street and learn that stuff. That's not important. The 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 reading, re writing, arithmetic. That's important. They can't right. just pick that up on the street. Right. So is it the value or the value, the dough? It's, I think not, it's, both. it's not worth it. I don't think we value our healthcare value-wise, and I know Elisa will weigh in, but I also don't think that we have sh we're showing the value because it's too long-term. All the studies have been done, healthy body, healthy mind. Look at, you, you know, if you have a healthy population, you're going to have a more productive population. But that's too long for people to wrap their heads around in terms of the commerce side of it. Um, the reading, writing, and arithmetic is immediate. You have four years here, four years there. And then you're going into a job. That's value. I need to do this, do this, do this, and here's the money allocation along the way. So I, I don't think it's I don't think it's showing the value. Yeah, I think I think you're right. And I originally shook my head. No, it's not the money. But you're but you're right. It is the money in, a, in an indirect way. It is the money as well. We do not value this from a health side. We don't value this from a preventative health measure either. And we're looking at taking kids and giving them the skills that they can have for the rest of their life. So if you're not teaching them those skills at a young age. They're, they're less likely to pick them up later in life and more likely to drop out of them at those social awkward phases where they have, especially in their teenage years, which we know that. The stats are very clear on that. The stats are very clear on the health of our kids is getting worse. Stop shop. The health of our kids is getting worse. I don't care how you cut it. I don't care what metric you use. I don't care what data you use. It is 100% clear around the world. Now, it's a massive problem. There's nutrition components. There's social economic components there's a whole bunch of things but movement teaching people and teaching people how to move and how to love movement and want to move and building communities that facilitate that and value it is a whole component in it, in and of itself and then also building components where they they value the monetary gains that come from it business understands that having healthy employees saves them money so there is a, a dollar figure associated to that and so we're in a public school space when I'm saying no, when I shook my head no, I was looking at, well, PE doesn't necessarily provide money back to the school, but as soon as you hit high school and college and university, there is a huge dollar value to athletes. So having an athletic program brings massive amounts of money, billions of dollars of money, good, bad, otherwise, that's a whole other conversation, but there is a value system to that when it comes to the dollar figure. So again, if our participation rates start, start dropping at a young age, all that money goes away and it goes into bad places when it could have gone into the health of our kids and our future. So it's Amen. both, I agree. Amen.
Matt said one more thing that I want to touch upon. He talked about the, we're not getting the best athletes. We're getting the guys that can pay basically. Yeah. So they're heading over to academy sports schools and whatnot. And those guys do, do they have it right? Where it's half school, half training. Do they have it right? Or is that too far on that on the left? Well, I would suggest that they have it right if they're going to invite everybody and there's no mon monetary barrier to entry. But if there's, as soon as you put in the, this is going to cost you more, um, then you, it's the bifurcation of the, of the talent pool. So well, let, me, let me ask you a question. So if, if I have a six figure salary and so does my partner and we want to give our kid an opportunity where they can go off and they can play at a high level and we see the opportunity to spend the money and get them into the program, should I not be able to do that because the person beside me can't do that? Yeah, but that's not the, the uh, absolutely you should be. That's, but that's not the point we're trying to make. It, the, I think the point we're trying to make is we used to have that for everybody. Yeah. And, and that's what Daryl's point is, is as soon as we went away from the specialist physical education teacher that was instructed to, that would answer your question, Elisa, which is what is quality daily physical education and, and how does it work? And when you had someone that had expertise around that, well, then nobody was being left out. But as soon as that went away for a variety of reasons, then that, that put us into this two-tier system. The academies and the sportspreneurs, they jumped all over. They say, hey, wait a minute. I'm going to throw one other little, little thing in here for us to mash around in this pot stirring we're doing. Is a PE specialist always good at delivering PE? Not necessarily, I don't think. So, so is, is the answer to this just bring back PE specialists? No, not in my view. I think the answer would be to bring back a PE specialist and make sure that we have a system that supports their continual growth, just like we do with all of the other teachers and all the other instructors in school. It's not just leaving somebody in an island. And, and again, this goes back to a lot of things that we say in the, in the podcast, etc. We have to be in 2020. We have to be in 2021. We have to be. We have to meet people where they are at the time they are. So physical education, when we in 1992, 95, 97, shouldn't look the same as it does in 2020 because a lot of the conditions around that are different. And one of the problems we have, one of the reasons we have a problem staying relevant, I believe, is that we're not changing. We're, we're clinging to the way that's the way we've always done it. We, we don't actually evolve with the kids, with their interests, with the hot topics, with what's new, with what's what's happening. Uh, you know, mental health is a big issue. I'd like to see that woven in. Why aren't we talking about that early and often and instead of waiting for a mental health issue to, um, to show itself? And why are we having this mental health? Could we trace that back to arguably the decline of physical education and, and the rise in mental health? I'm sure somebody will put a, an evidence-based package together, which we'll talk about later. But, um, you know, I, I think, Elisa, you know, it's not, no, it's not just having the you, you said it earlier, there's lots of good and bad police, doctors, teachers, trainers, in any profession. So it really is about that professional and continued professional development and support. Yeah, I think it will help. I think it will help. But as Matt said, it's, it's not going to be, it's not the perfect model. And if they're not continuing to sharpen their tools, the saw and, and, and get better and, and keep changing with the time, it's, it's going to be the same thing down the road because they're going to be stale. It's one of the reasons I left phys ed, I left the profession of, of being a, a physical education teacher is because we weren't progressing. It's one of the reasons I didn't take phys ed because when I went in to do the practicum, I saw the box and Daryl, you talked about it. This is your box. And at least you talked about it a couple podcasts ago. Don't go outside your box. This is what you can do. And I was like, okay, well, this is not me. I got, I got energy. I want to help these kids. I want to help this young, these young men and women be more confident, competent, connected and capable human beings um, so and, and that doesn't happen in a linear progression that that is not linear and that is not check the box yeah I think just absolutely you guys you guys nailed it exactly just because you're a specialist doesn't mean you're the best so there's a lot of really good professionals and, and colleagues that I have in in various fields who aren't necessarily a specialist and one of the reasons I say that is we've done some work with the university programs so the university programs that are that are delivering PE content and academics to these kids who want to go out and be a PE teacher. And what was the school in Ontario that, that cut PE? You remember, was it Queens? What school yes. Was it? It was Queens? Yes. So they cut their PE program. 
So, you know, we don't, we don't need to teach this anymore. And the, and the people I have spoken to that I've either gone to school with or that I knew going through the program in, in around the world, not just in Canada and, and the US, around the world, the content that they get for a generalist teacher to deliver PE is minuscule. As a PE specialist, you get more content, but again, it goes back to my first question, what is PE? And is, that, is PE just teaching sports? Is PE just teaching fitness? Is, what is PE? What does it look like? Because we need to look at our university and our post-secondary institutions to say, well, what are we teaching our PE specialists to deliver? Because as you said, Matt, it's 2020, we got to evolve. And so if those programs aren't evolving, our PE specialists, the few that we have, won't evolve. But we're also seeing generalists evolve to fill a gap that exists in the system. Sorry, Daryl. I, can, I think I can talk to that a little bit with Queens. One of the reasons they cut it, because there was no jobs. These guys were graduating from physical education. There was no jobs. I was teaching at the University of, of Toronto, and I felt bad for these guys because these guys were going to be sick teachers. They were motivated. They were hungry. They were young. They were ex-athletes. But there was no jobs. And so they had to become generalists. They had to learn this other stuff. And the thing is, it, it's, it, it's sad, but... It's, it's true. There was nothing for them. So they said, if there's no more specialists needed, then we're out, we're out of luck. Why are we having this? Like, we don't want to have a, a program where it leads to nowhere. And, and that's what was happening. And that's why they cut it. And that's, I felt bad towards the end of my t uh, U of T uh, tenure there, not tenure, my, my career. I felt bad for teaching these guys because I knew there was no job. They're going to end up in the bar they're going to end up a bartender or something or a personal trainer, all this education to just be a personal trainer, nothing against personal trainers now, <laughs> but that's what happened. For sure. And you're exactly right. If you're, if you're preparing someone for a job that doesn't exist anymore in the space, what are you really preparing them for? So Elisa, your question, you know, what is PE? I, I like the words that you used was to um, teach, how to move and to teach a love of movement or an appreciation of movement. I think that's what quality that's what it is. That's holistic. That's a holistic approach because that's more than just, you know, here's how to run, get your angle of incidence, your high knees, your running A's, B's and C's. It's also having a discussion around the benefits of how you feel, what you want to do, things you want to try, exploration, all of that stuff and, and a mix of free play and, and fundamental movement skill. Um, mastery and fundamental sports skill mastery if that's your pathway movement skill mastery if you just recreation or just want to move and be healthy in life fundamental sports skill mastery if you want to take a higher performance pathway so it doesn't it irregardless of the pathway and and that's been hammered you, you know that's kind of the reason why a lot of the teachers that weren't confident you know well I just do that you know just the specialist and all the sport and you know blah, 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 high performance that kind of boohoo in us it, it's not just for that it's it's for competent movers in life and and we see again the benefits do not have to be explained so i would suggest that it could be at least as simple as that and that statement simple but not easy 100%. Yeah. very big difference and, and last bit on that is and and phys ed uh is not to turn people off of phys ed because how many people we know are turned off of exercise because their phys ed teacher was a jerk no, and they use they use push-ups as a punishment. And, and I don't want I don't like push-ups. Why don't you like push-ups? Because my teacher used to make me do them all the time when we did we're bad. So that's what it's not. Yeah, yeah exactly. Using physical education for a punishment. I mean, man. I mean, that's, that's, that's another podcast. Yeah, that is another podcast. Well, it's the same thing as a poor quality coaching. And, and again, that's why I don't think educators and coaches and parents and volunteers we, we silo all those people when we're talking about leadership we're talking about the same thing it's leadership leadership is leadership whether you're a parent or a coach and most parents are coaches or most parents become phys ed teachers or so that that has to go all around but that goes into that question that was asked about what are the barriers of quality daily physical education it's because it seemed like a punishment all right we got to do our daily physical education for you know or whatnot and they saw it as a punishment or people weren't motivated. You, you asked what are the barriers? Well, it was seen as we made it seem like work as opposed to fun, as movement as you were talking about. Um, 
kids weren't motivated. It became like a fool around period. Teachers didn't put any effort into that period. If you're not going to put any effort in, you're not going to want to do that. Oh yeah. It's just an afterthought. Oh yeah. I got to do that daily phys ed thing. Come on, let's go guys. You're a kid. You know, the teacher, Oh, teacher doesn't want to do this. I'm going to screw around. This is my screw around time. That's what happens in the school and people, no one's telling people that this is happening. Teachers don't want to do it because it's like a punishment for these kids. That's how the kids see it now. Yeah, I agree. And then Lisa talked about this. You've talked about this a lot in that physical education has a marketing problem uh, more so than anything else. And, and so let's, let's just be current. Let's bring ourselves up to 2020 and what's happening right now. So Joe Wicks, um, guy from the UK comes out of the UK and, and says, listen, uh, everyone's at home. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go online and I'm going to host little virtual daily workouts. I'm going to try to make it fun and I'm going to offer it up how people want it, when they want it, where they want it and how they're consuming it. And the response from the physical education community has been up in arms. Oh, how can this be happening? Is this the face of physical education? What is going on here? This is not pedagogically correct, blah, 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 and terminology out the wazoo and let's have discussions and rooms and we need to align and the call to arms, et cetera. Go, Daryl, Lisa. Lisa Lisa wants to go, man. Okay, can I go? Thanks. Go, go. First of all, first of all, now, when I heard about this, and you guys both know, I'm not on social media. I have no desire to be on social media. So someone had to tell me that this whole big kerfuffle was going on. So when I started looking into it, I looked, okay, who is the consumer? The consumer are kids, and parents of those kids. They are, he has millions of views and subscribers on his workouts. You said it, Matt. He is providing, and correct, please correct me if I'm wrong, he is providing 30 minutes a day of fitness and making it fun for parents and kids to do during COVID, okay, okay? He is a fitness professional, does not claim to be a teacher, has said, I will be your PE teacher during COVID. That's a marketing. He has chosen a way to market to kids using PE terminology during COVID. So he has, let's let's recap. He has millions of kids getting active with their families and parents during a time that is unprecedented when kids cannot go to school and they're active at home doing fitness. The thing, Daryl, you just said has been used as punishment. So, the, so, so I'm wondering, okay, well, what's the problem with this? The problem is that he called himself a PE teacher during COVID. That was a marketing term. He's using that to connect with the kids and say, this is something connected to what you do. Cause, because we know fitness is a component of physical education, a component. So he is teaching something, delivering a service that is a component of physical education. Can you only teach that? during the the 20 minute, 30 minute block you have twice a week in schools? And can it only come from a PE specialist who we've already said doesn't exist in every school? So sorry, if he can't do it, generalist teachers can't do it either. What kind of nonsense is this? How dare clients? How dare dare the population tune into something that can help them? He's like Netflix. (laughs) He's like Netflix. Netflix for kids. With squats. And push-ups and fun, and he wears costumes. Uh, yeah, but I think the lesson and the takeaway is: look at if you're not gonna, if you're just going to be stuck in your ways and check the box and do things the way you've always done it, you're going to create space for somebody to do it better, and that's what's happened. Is someone has taken this opportunity and they've done it better. Um, wh- whether you like it or not, or don't like it, that that is life, and that is the reality of a free market, and uh, and he's fully taken advantage of it. And you know, instead of smashing it and I agree with you both, instead of smashing it, maybe we should take some, something and learn from it. Maybe we should be saying, hmm, since we're not being successful at home, maybe more of us should do this for our own uh, people in our own spaces and, and uh, look into doing this and taking from what is happening and creating a, a great environment to do that. Go ahead, Daryl. I got one more, I got another thing to say, but go ahead. You know my problem with John Wicks? My problem Joe. is, Joe, oh, sorry, Joe. Joe, John, John, John is, the, is the hero. John, yes, John. John. You know my problem with Joe Wicks is I didn't think of this first. <laughs> That's my problem. I, I am an actual PAP teacher. I could have said it and no one could have said anything. 100%. Great. 
You know what I like about this cat? This guy is engaging. He's got the English accent. Everybody thinks someone with an English accent is smarter than anyone else anyway. But he's doing that thing that I, I, I refer to as entertainment. He's entertaining these kids. He's making it fun, engaging. And they want to come back and they're like, I just worked my ass off and I had fun. I can't believe that. That, that shouldn't go together. But he's making it fun. Great point. And, and that's what kids want. You, you, you got to hide it. It's work, but it's fun. They, he, he made it fun like play. And anybody who's against this cat, they're just, it, it's more about the money. Sour grapes. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Sour yeah. grapes. Yeah, sour grapes. Because this guy's, I hope he's making a lot of dough. I hope yeah. he's making a lot of dough. And, uh, and hopefully he listens to this podcast and gives us a shout out because we're shouting him out. <laughs> now, now let me ask you, let me ask, let me ask you guys a question. Cause again, I, I fully, I don't fully understand what the problem with, with this is. This guy's getting kids active during a time when they're not, and he's using a, a method, you know, YouTube with, you know, you always say, I think Matt, meet people where they're at. This is where the kids are right now. They're on screens all day long. When I was looking into this, I looked up to, you know, what are other teachers doing right now? Because again, I, I'm working with some teachers and they're trying to interact with their kids on screens. There was a video that was posted on social media of a kid talking to his teacher and, and the teacher said to him, have you gained weight during COVID? And the kid, who was a rail, by the way, he was not overweight by any stretch, which is not the metric we need to focus on, but this is what the teacher asked him. Have you gained weight? You look like you're getting heavier. That's what the teacher said to the kid. The kid shut it off, started crying, and immediately started doing push-ups and sit-ups and, and squats and everything while crying. So what? here's an example. This is yeah. real? This is real, yeah, I'll find the video, I'll, show, I'll send it to you. Here's a, here's a real example of exactly the same concept. Person on the other end, some kind of video stream, making the kid feel like they need to do fitness, but doing it in a very different way. So this guy who's doing this, getting kids excited about it, getting families engaged, getting parents engaged, and teaching them to love movement, I have no problem with that. And if the PE specialist or the PE community is going to have a problem with this, you need to stop and look at what is he doing that's hurting these kids? What is the problem here? And is it, I know one of the arguments is that it's not pedagogy. It's not meant to be. I, I don't believe, and correct me, I don't believe he's meant to do, he hasn't put this together as a curriculum that he's putting with the ministry. This is, this is something he's doing to get kids active during a pandemic. What is the problem? He's so not saying I'll when you go back to school. It's not evidence-based. It's fitness, fitness is evidence-based, Matt. Yeah, what is, what is evidence-based? Yeah, what Please is explain. that? Let's get into that discussion. I mean, the next question, Matt. Is yeah, it? well, you know what? Hey, listen, I agree. And the more, the saying is the more something threatens your existence, the more you avoid it or criticize it. So that's what's happening right now. Um, this, this young person has come in and said, I, I'm going to do something a little bit different. And it's, it's hopefully, hopefully, because we're all about solutions. So hopefully the takeaway is, hey, let's rethink how we're doing stuff. And if it calls PE educators in, together from around the world to talk about how they can uh, reformat themselves or reinvent their, their craft and, and fight for better space and, and specialist visit teachers and, and demand higher, well, that's great. So that's a great outcome from it. But if it's just gonna be a, let's throw mud against somebody because they're doing something different, which typically happens, then, uh, then we're just we're not moving the whole profession ahead, and and I know that's the three of our our main goal is moving the profession ahead. Okay, so evidence based. Let's get into evidence based because this is a, a, a an area where I I I am just so sick and tired because when you look at the purpose, what's the purpose of science? When you look at the purpose of science, it's to study something that has happened and draw conclusions. All the early scientists were observing stuff that was already in play and then creating the science behind it. Now it seems like we were using evidence-based, not we, mostly governments and organizations that are too lazy to look for innovation. Uh, we, we, we're using evidence-based as the box to say yes or no, because we're going to uh, put this forward. Yes. Is it evidence-based studied? No. So, so we're, we're using it to critique things now before they even get into play. And my issue with that is that you can take a small sample size and basically, and Elisa, you, you and I are at the meeting where the, the, that researcher, and she was really humble and brilliant. She said, listen, 
evidence-based is like interrogation, scorch the data long enough, it'll tell you to tell you whatever you want to know. So now what we're seeing is we're seeing, you know, governments say, we're not going to approve this program because it's not evidence-based. So we're not going to take the time to think about, does it actually make common sense or not, unless it's evidence-based. So here's our people on speed dial, we call them, we've got our researchers on online. I, I, at least I believe we refer to them as the rock stars of research and they're online, you can call them up, they'll do the evidence-based study, which means they'll get a small controlled sample size, put in the whole thing, check, yeah, we did it, two months later, cost 25 grand for them to do it, and you've got your evidence-based stamp of approval, and I'm sorry, I'm just not buying that. Over to you two. Matt, we were the first evidence, we were the first Joe Wicks with the 60 Minute Kids Club. Yeah. We were the first. And, and what did they say to us? We need this to be evidence-based. And we went out and found some, and they still gave us a hard time. You, like, so what I'm trying to say is where, where people are is they don't, they don't understand that, as you said, innovation. Like, we were innovative with the 60-Minute Kids Club. It, it, was, it was before the Fitbit, all that stuff. And I'm not trying to toot our horn, but the 60-Minute Kids Club was the precursor to all that stuff. It's just people weren't ready for it. And as you said, that evidence base, we had to, we were delayed because we had to go out and get research. People were shutting doors on us and saying, nah, it's not, a, this is cool. How do we know it works? How do we know it works? Well, as Lisa said, it's fitness. We know fitness works. We know it, if you train, if you feel better, all these things come from fitness. And, and that's why I, I say we were the original Joe Wicks. We just didn't, keep fighting that yeah no i concur and, and i would say i would suggest you know before lisa weighs in i would suggest that if we reflect on that process so what we did from the 60 minute kids club for those who don't know is we actually took all the evidence-based um uh, you know 60 minutes of moderate to vigorous physical activity a day less than two hours of screen time proven uh kelty mental health resource group we work with them on helpful and unhelpful thoughts for mental health uh, five fruits and vegetables a, bit, a, a day, which is basically dietitians of Canada approved, which is evidence-based. All we did was take all of that stuff and put it into a marketing package to increase the amount of uptake because the way it was being delivered is PDF, boring as hell, non-engaging. You're like, you're right. Just like Joe Wicks, it wasn't fun. So we levered after the Olympics and, and getting people together and the information that we knew and we delivered a product. Um, what was interesting is we delivered the product and were successful way before we, we went and, at, and, and were demanded to get evidence-based. And I find that interesting because when we finally did get up to scale, and I mean by scale, I mean that program was over, it saw over a million households, we, all three of us were involved in it, over a million households in, in Canada and eight countries in the world, a, a, a doctor from Malta won a health award from using the tool, an engagement tool. Um, you know, the universities in, in, in Australia asked us to use some of our tools to teach the teachers. So it wasn't that it wasn't uh, uh, useful, it was that it was threatening to the funding and the existence of some of the key government funded players in our country. It was, it was, it was a threat to their existence. Um, and again, at least and I, we talk about this all the time. And, and that is, you know, why do we say no to things? We say no to things because that's out of self-preservation. Well, who are these guys? And I remember we always got those questions. Who are these guys? They're personal trainers. So this is a perfect discussion for us to have on the heels of Joe Wicks and Fizzed, because everyone used to go, these guys are personal trainers. How can they come in with this insert, which we had studied at University of British Columbia, which Nike's design to move team had done a $45 million global study, identified all the things we had them, they contacted us. Like it was all there. It was just such a, a crock of crap in terms of, you know, we needed to get it evidence-based because it just made everyone look foolish. Elisa. Yes. So evidence-based is a really interesting topic. There's val again, with everything, there's value to it. And there's also value outside of it. You look at practice like take take east or western medicine versus eastern medicine western medicine talks about evidence-based and they grew up with if you can't prove it it doesn't exist eastern medicine looks at well we've done this for thousands of years we know it exists 
because of the experience we have with thousands of years. So what is the value with experience versus evidence? And again, very, very different. And we can argue back and forth which one is reign supreme over the other. I went to a conference, one of my favorite conferences I ever went to. It was up at uh, SFU, Simon Fraser University. It was called Science Versus Practice. And one of the coaches there, Al Vermeil, who's won rings in two pro sports, he talked about, they were talking specifically about plyometrics. And they were talking about, we didn't have the science to prove plyometric activities and exercises worked. We didn't even know they were called plyometrics. We would have guys jump off of something high, rebound onto something else, and we knew it made their vertical jump better. We just, we just knew that. Now we have the science to prove why that works. So that was a really big aha moment. And that was one example, there's lots more. That was, that was a big aha moment of, here's an example of practically, we know this works. We can't really explain it, but we know it works and we know how to utilize it to get a desired result, which is a lot of times what people do when they're innovating. And I'll, and I'll ask anyone, it doesn't always work. Sometimes it fails and it's bad. And we know that. And there's stuff that's been evidence-based that has come out to actually harm people. And there's medicine, there's nutrition, there's all kinds of data out there that shows what we thought was evidence-based, actually not so good for us. So <laughs> evidence-based is not reign supreme over anything either. You need the two. And you can't be closed-minded to say, just because it's evidence-based and you need to pick that apart, just like you were saying, Matt, depending who provided that evidence and what their methodology was. And I learned this in school, when wherever we were looking at journal articles, they made us pick apart where are the flaws in this? Because just because it's published doesn't mean it's any good. So going back to our conversation about PE, what PE curriculum is evidence-based? And we just, here in BC, we just went through a whole curriculum revamp. Our new, our new BC Ministry of Education curriculum, I'll, I'm not a teacher, so I can't answer this question, is it evidence-based? And I would argue, because I've been through lots of conversations about this, lots of conferences talking about this, lots of controversy about this new curriculum. Is it evidence-based? Do you guys, curriculum, evidence-based? Hell no. Hell no. 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 Now, there are pieces of it that are, that we have, you know, like fitness, we know teaching sports helps us get engaged in sports. Like, there are parts to it that we know are evidence, is the whole process evidence-based? Yeah, no, and that and that's that's what that's what the, the conversation is, and I and I agree. There is some validity to evidence-based, but it seems to have turned into a checkbox, and it seems to turn into a checkbox that provides a nice, tidy salary for the familiarity uh, people that are in the system that go, "Can you evidence-base this for me?" Yep, and, and you know, when we got told, "Hey, listen, give me twenty-five grand, and I'll make sure that your program gets evidence-based." That was pretty much enough to hear for me to know that this was a sham and and just like everything else it probably had its merit but we we we, we seem to lose the weight at the end of the day evidence base should not be the only indicator and it sh certainly shouldn't replace common sense because thank god elon musk uh, google and uh, bill gates and apple and religion did not have to be evidence-based for them to operate in society because otherwise we would be in just a constant state of fair kerfuffle and and is hardly any innovation would happen and and you know the evidence-based checkbox again is that linear pathway to development which is not what is happening in the world and innovation it's just not um so if we want to you know criticize and the number one criticism of of joe wakes is ev not evidence-based is that what our society cares about? Or is that what you care about? Or is that what you have to have as a feather? Or is that what protects your job? So I think that's the question on evidence base that we, that we need to answer. And, and again, my biggest thing is, it, I just don't want to see evidence base become that additional barrier to innovation because people are lazy. Well, this, all this evidence based stuff reminds me of when I was teaching at U of T and the students would go and talk about training or muscle mechanics or whatnot and they would go to their lecture and they would come back and say hey daryl would you can, can we talk about this stuff and i was like well, what do you mean and i would talk about it in plain terms and say hey i'm out there training people and this is what i'm actually seeing and they'd be like they they got it and and they got in trouble because 
they would go back to class and, and put it in some of those plain everyday words that I would put it in and say, where'd you learn that? I was talking to Daryl and he sort of broke it down for me. So <laughs> I didn't have evidence base other than the theory. I was out there doing it with people and athletes. And then these guys were reading about it and talking about it. And this was, this was strange to me because I thought that I wasn't, by no means am I saying I was smarter than the professor, but I, I was like, I had to put everything to a story. I had to make it a story so I understood it. So that's how I explained it to the kids. I turned it into some analogy for them to understand it. And they, they, were, they could run with that. So I got in a little bit of trouble and they were like, you should get your PhD, you should get your PhD. I'm like, no, 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 I'm good. This is because I, I like being in the, in the real world and testing out these things that these guys have said. So you know what? Eh, it doesn't exactly work like that. If I tweak it a little bit, it works a little bit better. Put a little pepper in there. And it worked. It tastes better. So this, this is where we have to, to talk to people and say, hey, man, this, going back to Joe Wicks, run with this, buddy. Run with this. I don't know where you're going, but keep running. You, you got it like and, and working in the space you know as a teacher you got to be in that environment and you were you know a teacher in the schools as a teacher in the post-secondary or two two different areas but it's the same context so if we're thinking like in absolutes what is the absolute answer to this we're, we're not we're not asking the right question or we're not taking in information in a critical lens we need to look at the whole picture and the whole picture can include everything that we're talking about but at the end of the day so it can be evidence-based or not it can be a generalist teacher or not it can be a PE specialist or not it can be fitness or not it can be a whole bunch of things at the end of the day it, again back to everything that we've said is it delivering quality PE and how we define that is so big and so broad so whether it's evidence-based or not whether it's PE specialist or not all these things is it giving us the end result? And the end result, in my opinion, and the whole work that I ever care about is, are people more active for longer? So for, the, for their life, and active in a way that is healthy for them, mentally, physically, emotionally, socially. And if our answer is yes, I think we're doing a good thing. It's not hurting people. If it's hurting our concept of what's right and wrong when it comes to what we've always done or you think is the right way to go that's a different question and that is what we're debating that is what we're arguing against but put our egos aside put our closed-mindedness aside is it delivering what we expect to see when it comes to quality physical education and the goals of that and that i think is a question we need to keep focusing on instead of poo-pooing on the people who are out there grinding it out every day doing the best they can yeah, and Daryl, I think I, that's a great point, Elisa. And Daryl, I would just only add one thing: is that no, there's two types of knowledge. There's the book, the book knowledge, the learned knowledge, and, and then there's the experiential knowledge, the going and doing it, um, the applied knowledge. And I think it's where people benefit is actually a bridge between the two. Going to study, some, going to listen to somebody tell me something that they've never actually done, they've only studied, would give me pause for consideration. I would want them to bring in, and the good educators do bring in, real access and real expertise from in the industries that they're in um, to share with the, to share that knowledge with the kids. And, and, and for themselves, like you said, Daryl, like actually being, being a good coach and being a good educator, they're all the same thing. So I just think there's, there's more than one type of knowledge, and that knowledge is more than just relying on evidence-based as your as your opinion and the last thing i'll say about this in the sports sector is i just want the people to zip their mouths that say is the ask me the question is that evidence-based at the same time as they're throwing out long-term athlete development and athlete development matrix models which have never ever been evidence-based so don't talk out of both sides of your mouths uh, you know you know understand that there's going to be innovation and it might work and it might not work and i don't I don't disagree with doing the study, but do the study in, in a manner where it's going to have a large impact on a large group and it's going to span a, a variety of years and don't just cut off something uh, and say, well, that's not evidence-based at the same time as you're, as you're rolling out 
long-term athlete development. And, and it's like, we got there first, now we're shutting the door so nobody else gets in. And, and, we, and we're gonna protect what we've created. And, and I am a fan of, uh, just to be clear, both long-term athlete development and the, and the American development model. That's not my point. My point is, when the sport organizations ask us or ask anyone else, well, is that evidence-based at the same time as they're promoting that? It's hypocritical. I understand that. And I, just to add that one point to that is, you know how many athletes I met, pro athletes, I'm sorry, not, not just athletes, pro athletes that they don't even know how they got there. How'd you get, how'd you get to be in a pro or where, what'd you do differently? Uh, I played baseball and I played soccer and I played hockey. Main, hockey was the main thing. They, they don't even know how they got there. So going back to your long-term athlete, yes, there is a pathway, but you know what I mean? Is it evidence-based? Is it it's linear? all that matters. Yeah. Is it in the box? Is it the same for everyone? Is it linear? Exactly. Yeah. So we, on that note, first steps. These aren't going to be easy today. First steps. Lisa. So we need to stop looking at things as absolutes. People are different. Environments are different. Contexts are different. If you're looking at an absolute, you know, only evidence-based matters. Only PE specialist matters. Again, I'm, take, I'm talking about the context we had today. If you're looking at absolutes and blinding yourself to everything else, that's the wrong approach. We need to be critical thinkers. And that's something that I think we're, we're, we're dropping back in a lot of times, especially with an influx of social media. We're taking what's coming at us. We're just taking it at face value and not really internalizing. Well, like Matt said, the common sense piece. So I would, I would argue one, one first step out of here, instead of looking at something as an absolute, because you know someone with a, you know, a degree bigger than yours told you that's how it is. Be a critical thinker in every single context and keep putting it back to: Is this getting us the end result we want in a healthy way? So that would be, that's one of my first steps out of here. First steps for me, leadership. I mean, that was a really good point. That could be a mic drop right there. Mine would be leadership. So both of you brought up great points about it doesn't matter if you're a specialist if you're just a crappy leader because no one's going to follow you. So I think leadership needs to be something that is taught and shared and practiced in the practical settings as early as possible, right through high school uh, and definitely university courses, regardless of the courses that you're taking, there is no leadership course mandatory. Um, and that should be as mandatory as making sure you have to take English 101, which is, is pretty compulsory for most university faculties in Canada anyway. So I'd like to see that leadership. And, and if you can't get that leadership from universities, first steps, go learn how to lead and manage other people because it's different than leading and managing yourselves. That would be my first step. Daryl? And I'll, I'll add on the leadership because I always, I, when I go last, I, all my stuff gets stolen. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna go on the leadership. But I, I think as a leader in, in this field, if you're gonna be a teacher, you're gonna be, you got to get good at observing and seeing what's working and evolve with it. Like this, not, this is not working. Okay. Reassess, figure out what works. Meet, you know, someone said it today, meet them where they're at and, 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 and help them. But we, we need to be more engaging with these kids. And if we don't make, uh, or value, in your words, Lisa, if we don't help people value physical and health education, we're in trouble. Like, we're in trouble. Like, we are going to continue to see bad things on the other end, mental health, obesity, all those things. And we, we, we didn't even talk about that stuff. That's the, that's the byproduct of this not working, a not fund, lack of fundamental skills, lack of phys ed teachers, is the byproduct of all this crap. So my first steps is we got to reassess what's happening because we're seeing the end products. Go back, observe, look what works, look for best practices, teachers, leaders, as you said, Matt, we have to become good at observing and doing shit about it. Oh yeah. All right. Well, on that note, guys, thanks for joining us today. Uh, just go play. If you like this podcast, please share it with your friends. Uh, we can always use more followers. Awesome, and guys. Thank you. Drop us some Thank questions. You. Questions, Thank you. yes. If you have questions, please send them in.
Thanks. Thanks, guys. You guys are awesome.